Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to another Grayscale Gorilla live show. Uh, welcome, Chad Ashley. How are you? Doing good. Fully caffeinated. Good. You got the hoodie memo. I'm glad we're uh, matchy matchy today. Yeah, uh, as my nephew would say. Standard um, issue. Yeah, standard, standard. How uh, hi live show. Hope you're doing well. Uh, thank you guys so much for being here today. Uh, we're going to be talking about lighting. We're going to be talking about HDRIs. We're going to be talking about how to make beautiful lighting in uh, Cinema 4D. And uh, we got we got the guy that taught me how to light in Cinema 4D here, which is pretty fun as well. So this will be a fun show. We're going to be doing uh, some demos as well, showing you how we uh, pick HDRI lighting and and even, maybe even some, some area light maps as well. So... Um, Thank you guys. Good to see you. Love seeing you all in the chat. Alan, uh, Fernita. Oh my goodness. Wendy, how are you? Walter, Sean. Hey, Sean. Sean. Good to see you. Peter, true tuber. I like that one. Leo. What's up, everybody? Uh, let me know where you're from and do us a favor. We just started the show. It helps us out. It helps YouTube know that there's people here. If you hit the like thing, the little thumbs up, that uh, gives YouTube a little jolt and says, yo, they're live and it'll invite some more people in here so we can get some more questions. So we would appreciate that if you could give us a little thummy thumb. And uh, Xander, what's up? Mohammed from Egypt. That's amazing. Australia's here. Fernanda, thank you. That's amazing. Facebook's here too. Wow, look at that. Libya, yo. Scotland. <laughs> we see you, Facebook. We know there's not as many uh, comments over there on Facebook, but we see you uh jacob john hope everyone's uh week is going well what day is it well we've got wednesday happy hump day everyone hope you're doing well hope you're working on something fun uh something creative this this week and uh man we have had quite the week as well um we uh we had a a, a quite a quite a big addition to grace Co gorilla plus that we'll we'll probably be showing you and talking about later um but man what a week a uh, lot going on and thank you oh my goodness look at all of you here Oh my God, this is crazy. All over the world. It was amazing. Dean, thank you. Hey, Dean's got a good idea. I want to do this. It might not be the show, Chad, but Dean has a scene file. He really needs help lighting. And I've always, like, again, we, we need to get the tech together to, to pull this off. But I think it'd be fun one day to have people send in their files. Like, it's okay. It's all done. It's all animated. It's all ready to go. But dang it, I can't get the lighting good. And man, I can't think of many more people than you that would be really good at starting to just not only show people how to make it look good, but also describe the process. And since we don't That's have sweet. that tech right now, what would you um, what would you tell Dean right now? Like what what I would help say, um, uh, man, there's a lot of different things you can do. So uh lighting is really kind of tricky but it's also very simple and it's really easy to get in over your head and just thinking like let me add more lights let me add more lights and my um whole philosophy on lighting is as few lights as possible like as absolutely few lights as possible because uh it can get overwhelming and um if you're doing a complicated shot then uh, it's a good idea to try to like use as few lights as possible just for your own sanity. But um, yeah, I try to use as few lights as possible. But honestly, it's like all starts with good reference and good reference and understanding how lighting actually works in the real world. Because let's face it, a lot of our renderers right now are basically like the real world happening in the render engine. So um, <laughs> right. it, it really is like using the same techniques and the same thought process that you would if you had lights in your studio at your office or out in the world and just thinking about it that way. The other thing that I do as well is I, I study lighting. I study it. I watch films and I just like absorb how they're getting to what what the look they're, they're after. And when I was directing live action, I always sort of secretly wished I was a gaffer because I, I was always watching what they were doing and seeing the tricks that they would pull. And I, I would just bring a lot of those same little hacks and tricks into, into 3d. That's amazing. Uh, you, you were, I've told this story many times. I'll, I'll share the early version or the light version of it, which is you were the first one that really let me know, like just recreate the real world of lighting in 3d and, and you're more than halfway there. Um, and you pointed out, Hey Nick, you, um, are a, uh, 
a photographer, you know, studio lights, you know, all this stuff, bring that to your lighting and, and it'll be better. And that's actually what kicked off like get pro at what it's what kicked off all this stuff. So thinking about lighting in a, in a real world way is I'm sure what we'll be talking about today. And also a little bit of reference as well. Um, it may be worth, I, I wish I thought about this before the show, Chad, but I wonder if there's actual reference that we can go through, like maybe pull up some product photography and talk about how to get a look like that. Cause that stuff helped me a ton. Like literally magazines, I'm dating myself. There used to be these things that paper. <laughs> you pick them up at the airport. Pick them up. <laughs> you pick them up at the mall, <laughs> and uh, you flip through them. And there's these beautiful ads in there of jewelry and watches and sunglasses. And you would look at this beautiful lighting, and and then I, what when I knew I was getting better at lighting is when I could look at those those images and say, I think I know how the lights are placed in that studio mm -hmm. to be able to pull that off. So yeah, I'm sure we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that today. Dean, thank you. Uh, all right, let's see here. Boom. James, what's up? Good to see you. Um, so thank you everybody uh, for joining us today. We're going to answer questions uh, about lighting, about HDRI, um, and talk about the art of lighting. Um, I was going into this story a little bit uh, already, but when when I discovered, well, let me just share a quick story. I was working in and learning Cinema 4D. I was already familiar with After Effects and using 3D stuff there. I was familiar with photography and lighting, and I opened up Cinema 4D like many people I think open up Cinema 4D, which is here's all the facets to make 3D objects. And how does how did the deformers move stuff around? And how how does MoGraph let me animate all this stuff? And I would learn all these things, but then I'd get to the end, and if you just hit render, there's like a default light in the scene that looks like crap, you know. Um, and that's never good. Or if you're working in a third party render, there's not even a default light; it's black void when you hit render. <laughs> so I did what you did back ten years ago, which is grab a point light, and you add a point light to a scene and you're like, you hit render and it still looks like crap. <laughs> it still looks bad. And uh, it, it wasn't until, uh, you know, talking with Chad and learning more about this stuff that he introduced me to two major concepts. And I'm sure we'll be talking more about it today. One is using real lights. What do real lights have that fake 3D lights don't have? Well, they have fall off in the shadows. That's realistic. They're not point sources. Real lights have... Uh, a shape to them. So bring a light into 3D that has a shape to it, whether that's a rectangle or a square or a window shape, bring shape into it. Real lights in the real world have color, uh, even slight differences in um, temperature and color balance can help make a, 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 a photo look more real. And um, we, we talked about fall off and all of that stuff described uh, how to make better 3D lighting in general. So again, that's where like it pro came from. There were the default lights were so uh, not set up in a way that looked realistic that I wanted to build default or a plugin that built lights for you as an artist that lets you light with real lights. Well, Chad, that wasn't enough for Chad. He also had to come show me HDRIs. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm like, this was here the whole time. You mean I'm where really what? You, I built all these lights, all these soft boxes and learned espresso and and you could just go out with like a dome and capture this stuff and we'll and maybe we'll talk a little bit about when you use each type of light. But that's when it unlocked for me was HDRIs were a way to go out into the world and bake down all the 360 lighting, capture it in this image and then in in my world as like putting all the light in your pocket, carrying it home, and then opening it up in the 3D world and saying, hey, remember that light we captured over there? Do what that light was doing, but do it on my render. And the, the software goes, yeah, dude, I know exactly what to do. I have all this brightness detail. I have all this resolution. Let's go. And holy crap, it worked. And oh, yeah. so th those two things were the unlock for me for lighting realizing that studio lights are a part of product lighting and you could just light it the same way as in the real world. And the fact that HDRIs exist and are, uh, 
are a part of this whole this whole thing. So that was a long way to say that's that's that was my introduction to how to be better lighting, how to make better lighting, how to think about lighting in, in 3D. So before we get to a few questions, Chad, I wanted to ask you, what was your introduction to lighting in 3D and what was your process in learning all of this stuff? How did you get into this and become a better artist with it? Uh Whew, man, there's a lot to unpack on that one. Um, yeah, well, I, I was I went to college uh, for for film. I went to Columbia College in Chicago and studied film with a, a major in film and a concentration in traditional animation. So I hadn't really even touched a computer in college, but I did uh, through all my film classes. Really liked the process of lighting a shot. We were, you know, this is like, I'm going to really date myself because we weren't like even shooting video. We were shooting on Bolex 16 millimeter cameras. So we had to learn, but it was great because it, it forced you to learn uh, proper exposure and lighting and how to set up a shot and three point lighting and all that. And, you know, we were all terrible at it because, you know, it's just things that you don't think about when it comes to lighting and placing lights but you learn how to light talent. And when you learn how to light talent, it starts to click in your head and you're like, oh, okay, I get it. You know, a big light source is gonna give me really big shadows and a, a really small light source is gonna give me really tight shadows. And it starts to click in your head. And then when I um, took, when I got into 3D, which is a couple of years, like a, a year after I graduated, um, I, I was actually doing more animation, like character animation at the beginning. And then I discovered, I actually didn't even know that uh, 3D rendering even existed really because the studio that hired me to do animation was, I was just an animator. It was like one of those CG studios that really heavily segments everybody into different areas. So I was in charge of character animation. I would pass my scene file off and somebody else would light it. And when I would see it come back, I would be like, wow, like how did that work? Like, how did you make that? And the guy, um, I think his name was Dave Allen, uh, would show me uh, how, how it all worked. And this is like way back pre Maya days. And I was just really like super intrigued by it, but also kind of like grossed out by it because it didn't look real. It looked very CG, but I saw the potential there. And the idea that I could take some of that filmmaking knowledge and bring it into 3D was really exciting for me. So I started to get into it a little bit more, a little bit more. And then eventually um, I started to, uh, you know, discover other renderers like Mental Ray in Brazil and uh, V-Ray and 3ds Max and Maya. And like it, the, the quality would get better and the tools would get more photographic and then I would just get more excited. And then um, around the time when I got to DK, I started doing live action direction again um, where I was directing a lot of live action spots. So I was back on set capturing HDRIs and directing the spot. And watching and 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 working with a DP who's like crafting the light on set and seeing what tricks they do to make the beer bottle shine and all these like neat little things that I just like absorbed and took a lot of these gaffer tricks and uh, DP tricks into 3D. And as the tools got better and better, it just became way more easy. And I think, yeah, you know, it's like lighting in 3D is like infinitely easier than lighting a set. <laughs> <laughs> it's like where nobody is like having to lift heavy things and flag stuff off for three hours. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, that's kind of been my journey through it. That's amazing. It, it, it's, um, it, those things and, and, and obviously meeting you and learning from you the way that you thought about lighting. Um, not only, I was just thinking through this, not only inspired like it pro, which was our first plugin, but like I said, immediately after Like It Pro, I discovered a lot more about HDR and how that stuff worked. It inspired our second plugin, which was HDRI Studio Rig. And so HDRI Studio Rig came about because I saw the power of HDR and said, how do we combine um, seamless floor technology that was just becoming easier in Cinema 4D along with HDR and make it so that the dream, it was true, which is what you said. like. Lighting in the real world is like, if it doesn't work, you got to scrap it all and start over, or you have to move a light and then you have to hide stuff and, and change all the time. But what if you could instead just like click different lighting setups until it looked good, for example, and use lighting setups that were built by professionals. And that was the idea behind, um, uh, HRI studio rig and eventually became, um, 
uh, HDRI link for uh, third-party renders as well. So all of that stuff spawned from the idea that, okay, there is years and years of lighting thought, years of years of lighting uh, theory, and more importantly, something you said, Chad, was years of filmmaking knowledge that goes into creating an emotion with lighting. And this is something when you uh, start reading books about, uh, you know, uh, becoming a, like a, a DP or or working on set, that what you're really trying to do is tell a story or give the emotion of what you're trying to portray to the person that's watching. And most of that is done with lighting, right? So this was my favorite thing about the Pixar movie behind the scenes and all the stuff happening with like DVDs, you know, and all that stuff was you could actually sit and, and have an audio track with somebody that just worked on the lighting and they would describe to you why they chose a sunset shot for this scene because the sunset shot gave an emotion of things ending, you know, it's a little romantic, but it's like a sad romantic, mm -hmm. um, versus why did we front light this one? Well, a front light is a much more, uh, engaging and less dynamic, but very, um, focused on, uh, kind of everything type of light. And as you start to learn these things, you say, okay, now I know where all this stuff goes, or at least this is how I learned it. Now I understand all these, these emotions that you can trigger with light. Now, how do you mix and match them? Well, with this one, you actually need a sunlight, but with a little bit of a kick light to fill in things. Um, all of that stuff tied into um, my renders getting better as well. All of that stuff tied into me looking at a scene and saying, what emotion do I want my viewer to have? And if you work in motion design, you work in 3D, that's really a lot of your job is what emotion do I want them to have when they look at this object or render? Is it interest? Is it, um, I want to buy that. I want to own it. Is it something to read and I have to make it readable? There's so many things that come into what is the, uh, emotion factors. Yeah. Emotion slash action. You want the viewer to have when you look at it. And this happens even with a daily render. What are you trying to say with this image? And your lighting has a lot to do with that. So that was a big unlock for me learning that stuff. And thank you, Chad, for sharing that. That reminds um, me, do you remember pre dome light days when uh, people would build rigs where you would load in uh, an HDRI image and a rig would build an array of spotlights in a, in a dome. And what it would do, it was, a, it would take the image and like essentially put a number of spotlights in this dome and wherever the spotlight landed on the image, like imagine an image wrapped on a sphere and a bunch of, a bunch of spotlights pointed towards the center. It would take the color information of the pixel that it was near and just shine a bunch of, of uh, spotlights on the center. Do you remember those? I do. I, I built, that was, I think a part of either the first or like 1.2 of like it pro had a dome light that took that. This is before HDRI studio rig took an HDR and did exactly that because yeah. global illumination was so costly. Now we're just now we're just uh, showing how old we are. Global global illumination was so expensive as a uh, computational uh, switch to flip that you couldn't bear it. You could not animate uh, with global illumination. So that so the dome actually kind of cheated your way around that and yeah. gave you bounce light with with like point lights essentially i remember that oh my god I, I hated those things all right we'll do that at the end of the show we'll we'll talk about how uh how slow the comp computers were <laughs> rachel um, showing up to give props to paul de Bevic, the guy that uh, pretty much invented hdri so yeah that's amazing look him Thank up you, if rachel. you don't know his work he's actually doing some really insane stuff these days so check him out Thank you, Rachel. Thanks for coming. Thank you all for coming. Let's do this. Let's take some questions. Um, and uh, let's, um, so if you have a question, it would help us to see it in the chat here. If you said Q and then, um, or just question and then ask the question, that'll help us kind of find it. But please uh, bring your questions about lighting, about HDRIs, about, um, how to create an emotion or if you're struggling with lighting or if you have a specific type of scene uh, you're trying to recreate and uh, we'll we'll 
try to answer it. And if we need to, we'll even dip into Cinema 4D and try to recreate something as well. Um, so I think um, I think we'll do that. So bring get the questions going, um, and we'll get started here. Dean, let's just go with Dean's first question. I think it's a good one to start with. Dean asks, what do you guys think is missing lighting-wise from most renders that you see? So uh, we see a lot of you know renders online, Instagram, all that stuff. What's what's missing in in most people? Is, is most he asking articles? like what we think is missing in the tools, or what do we think is missing from other people's renders? I'm I'm thinking that this is like we see work all the time. Um, and what what is a what is it what is the artist missing technically or uh, or just uh, something they need to learn to make their lighting better? So. Uh, when we look at a render and we say, well, if I were to do it, what I would do is think of it this way and light this way. I think that's what he's asking. What's missing from most lights? And um, like, I'll, I'll let you go first. I, I think I got mine. Okay. Um, let's see. What do I think is missing lighting wise from most renders that you see? I think that most people, and I, I think I, I would put myself into this as well. Um, are probably using too many really diffuse light sources because um, it's easy to just grab an area light or an HDRI or something that has like a very big, broad light source. And I think we've just like become afraid of hard shadows. And I think hard shadows are cool. I think hard shadows, there's a use, there's a, there's a time for hard shadows. And I think that um, I, I do see some work showing up uh, where they're not afraid to do that. Um, and, and I think that's great because honestly, like when area lights became sort of like, um, widely used, you didn't see any hard shadows anywhere ever. <laughs> so I'm, I'm welcoming a, a little bit more of that. Uh, I'll also say that I think a lot of them, um, are kind of missing the point. And, and what I mean by that is that, um, they don't have a point of view and, and lighting should have a point of view. Lighting should have... Uh, uh, be a part of the scene, be a part of the story, um, and and really help tell tell the, the story that you're trying to tell. If you're trying to sell a product, then there's a whole other set of rules that go with that. If you're just trying to create um, maybe uh, an abstract piece, then okay, well, how does lighting contribute to that? So I think um, in a broad sense, I, I think some lighting, and it's usually all the stuff that everybody like shares because it's amazing because it has a point of view. It has it has something to say. And I think that's important. Yeah, um, I'll just add uh, two things that I see. Um, is I think especially for artists that uh, model or are are more about creating the geometry of the scene, I think that a lot of artists get too precious about showing every polygon and wanting to show off their model versus trying to tell a story. So, um, in other words, I know you spent a lot of time making sure that the ankle of the robot is, has this cool little thing on it. But at the end of the, at the end of the day, if the robot or the character looks more, uh, tells a story better, if it's in silhouette, then you may have to do that with your lighting and, and put 90% of the details that you just worked on in silhouette to make it look more uh menacing for example or more mysterious so to me it's not being precious about the object and all the work that you put into the thing but you you should do that and, and spend time on that but when it comes to lighting you have to divorce yourself from the object and really think of it as a tool to say this actually looks better with a rim really strong rim light and a really subtle kicker just to like light up the eyeballs um so that that would be one that i would would suggest yeah i think Ed, less like, is more you know yeah. like so the one thing that that i've learned is that um often what you don't show is more important than what you show because what you don't show the viewer draws in the blanks so your your instinct might be to light um a, a character a product or an object or something fully like nick was saying like your instinct is like let me show every nook and cranny and everything that i worked on but 
if you just let some of it fall into shadow or maybe most of it to fall into shadow and just a shaft of light cutting across the center, well, now the viewer is left to use their imagination and wonder what's under that in that shadow. And oftentimes what they're thinking is gonna be cooler than what you can put on the screen. <laughs> so that mystery and letting them engage and letting them, like to me, when, when I see a, when I see a, a, a great um, design or a, a, an art piece or a render or a movie, it's usually it's usually making me come up with some of that uh, creative information. Like I'm wondering what they're thinking, or I'm wondering what's in that corner under that shadow or around the the bend. And it's that um, uh, you're investing in it. You know, you're creatively investing in it as a viewer. And I think lighting has that power. Lighting, if done correctly, can really get somebody to invest in it and pull their eye to a sp specific part of the frame and all that fun stuff. Uh, Chad, just. I have one more thing to say about I this. I love this topic, by the way. This I is just the best topic. This is it. This is every show from now on. We're talking about lighting. I love it, obviously. Um, and while I'm saying my last thing about uh, Dean's question, can you pull up an example, Chad? Can you go find like a nice product render, whether it's 3D or um, like a product uh, photo shoot or something that shows that, that more of a silhouette, that more of a side light, that contrast mm. so that we could just pull it up and maybe even talk about exactly how those lights would be set up in the real world. So we could give a good example. If you could find something like that, I think that'd be really helpful. Um, and we could do a quick screen share, but I'll just yeah, say one more me, thing. Let me find it. I'll just say one more thing, Dean. And, and for anybody trying to take what they look at as basic lighting or flat lighting, I think it was described to, you know, where it's just like, Okay, there's light there, but what is it doing? Um, what I would what I would do is two ex, two things as an experiment. One is pull up one softbox, um, whether it's a Light Kit Pro or it's just an area light from Octane or or any third party render. They all have pretty good just basic area lights now. Open it up, get your render fired up. Get a nice model that you are comfortable with and put it in different positions around your uh, model and see what it feels like to you. Um, what does it look like when it's just and, and at a large scale too? So you don't don't make it too small, make it pretty large and put put it directly behind your model and let the light wrap around and go over the shoulders or or if it's even if it's just a sphere, like let it roll over the top and see what that feels like. It should feel you should have some sort of emotion. It backlighting feels more epic and feels more mysterious and feels more superhero, right? Then put it on the left side, directly on the left, or maybe just back into the left and say, okay, now I'm getting a little bit more shape and I'm seeing more of the shape of the object. It's not as mysterious, it's more you know, romantic from the backlight. Chad, you actually got a nice romantic backlight going on on your face right now. So if you look at Chad's Ooh. face, he's got a window. Uh, I, and I think I, 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 don't, I haven't been in this room, but I'm guessing there's a window back. Uh, if I'm looking at it back into the left in the back corner. So what that window is doing is casting this rim light around. It's giving it some nice uh, detail and you can see his hoodie it's obviously a black hoodie but it's falling into shadow his shirt is a little dark it's shadowy but this is actually a good setup for emulating a good basic light so just to finish my finish my talk about one softbox put one softbox in different places for your object and maybe even do a quick render and compare them and see what those emotions are and next time you have a um a render you can actually open this up and say, what feeling am I going for? And then you could start there. That's just one light. We haven't I've talked got about some samples now. We you're... haven't talked about multiple lights. And I think it'll be easier to show when we dive into Cinema 4D in a bit, or it sounds like Chad has some examples as well. So uh, Dean, it's a very common problem. Um, you know, there's there's a lot to learn with lighting. Um and it's a never ending journey. <laughs> you always are learning more about what lighting works. It's never, there's never a perfect answer. So that's, what's fun about all this stuff. Um, and that's uh, partly what's fun about using HDRIs as well. So 
um, right before we cut to Chad's screen here, part of the journey of HDRI for me was first of all, realizing that you can go to a outdoor sunset thing and get a beautiful, you know, sunset and then bring it into 3d. Uh, but then I saw that you can actually create studio lighting and not have to go set it up physically with, um, you know, soft boxes and all that stuff, but actually capture the whole studio and not just the lights, but the little details in the, in the craft services corner and the ceiling with the, with the, uh, exposed, um, uh, uh, you know, air conditioning. And so all those little details would show up in the HDR and would be captured and thrown onto these objects. And that's when I started to study HDRIs that I liked. So then what I would do is literally click through different HDRIs, find one that I liked, ain't wrote, rotated it until my object looked good and then studied where the lights were. Wow. The cool. There's like a big soft box in the back here. And then there's a little bright point light just on the, on the opposite corner. And then there's this nice overhead light with a little bit of blue tint to it. And I'm like, I like this look, this feels right. I bookmark that HDR and I would, um, also study that emotion because then I could recreate it with actual soft boxes if I needed to, even in the real world, I could bring that data into the real world in light. So that was my last little bit, Chad, you have some examples of product lighting we could kind of maybe talk about. Um, I just threw up my Pinterest of that. I have been uh, maintaining for a couple of years. Uh, Dean, thank you um, for the uh, question. And uh, keep the questions coming, and uh, we'll we'll uh, get some examples here. Chad, you're live. I'm going to make you full screen here, and uh, and then we'll jump back into a few questions. So, um, Chad, you have an example of maybe more of a silhouette shot to start with, just so we could see that, or not super silhouette, but something more rim lit or backlit that you can show. <laughs> yeah, this is an old. It's an old image of, of back when Nokia made phones, but. I do love just a really simple side lighting. Like Nokia is back, by the way, Chad. Diamond. Are they? No, it's really? just one of those GameStop things. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. You had me, dude. I was excited. Um, but yeah, just this, you know, you can't go wrong with a black on black product and uh, two 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 side lights, and really that's all there is, and maybe a a little bit of a kicker. Uh, to throw some light onto the onto the screen for the logo and whatnot, but like stuff like that is great. But really, what I love are like really really simple setups. This is probably like one light and maybe a bounce, and it just looks freaking beautiful. Like it, it's just like simple stuff. You so don't need that over light. Where would that light be? You think? Oh, it's just up up and a little bit to the right. Uh, and you can tell because you know you're you're not you can just look at the shadow on the front of the uh, of the face there. It's kind of like coming down over the this part of the inside of the watch, which tells me that the light is probably like you know somewhere in you know this kind of direction. Yep. And then maybe there's there might be there might not even be, but there could be another uh, source like down here. Um, like a bounce card or something that's just kicking off a little bit of bounce up into this surface here. Yep. But this this light up here is so big that it's able to crawl all the way over from this part down onto this part here and also give us a highlight there. So it's a pretty that tells me it's a pretty big source, but it's a watch. So any any source is going to be big to a watch. So it's that probably gonna, that, that reminds probably not me, insane. I feel like we're going through all the steps here with just one question, but that does remind me of something that was very important when I was getting better at this, which is the size of your light um, should be based on the size of your object. So if you ever want something to look small and precious, you should light it with a big light source because it's a watch, right? So the watch is, you know, an inch wide or two or however many centimeters that is. Sorry, euros, peoples. Uh, <laughs> Metric. Sorry, the rest of the world. <laughs> We're just the dumb country that still uses inches. So, you know, if it's this big, there's a spot, there's a soft box literally right here that's three feet wide. And anything you put below it will feel small because that's how we perceive things, right? There, There's not really a big enough light source to make a skyscraper cast a soft shadow, right? Because the only light source is bright enough and big enough to 
light up a skyscraper is the sun. So when you want something to feel large, you want it to have more uh, hard shadows. You want it to feel looming and big. It's a hard shadow thing. And whenever you want it to feel childlike and small, precious and beautiful and in your hand, you should you, you should try to use larger light sources. That, that, that was something that was an unlock for me to try to get that um, look that I knew I felt, but I didn't know how to describe. So other than just placement, you're going to hear us talk about size of light as well, because that will not just affect the shadow, it will affect the way the light wraps around, the reflections, and all of that stuff. Chad, you got another good one? This is beautiful. This is your Pinterest? This is just one of them. I have a bajillion. This is your beer, um, this is your beer Pinterest. This is kind of my product Pinterest, my product okay. photography Pinterest. Um, but yeah, I wanted to mention too, though, that like, uh, I, you know, some people kind of like poo poo on HDRIs for, for product shots. And I really think that a lot of times when you're, when you're just trying to get a natural feel like a natural, um, uh, source of light that it would be impossible to kind of get that in environment kind of light with a bunch of area lights. It's just not, not going to work. So something, um, like this type of product, you know, it's a, it's a coffee maker. Looks like they probably, uh, have, you know, they make beans or some sort of like measurement thing. I don't even know, but it, it has this like homey vibe. It's a warm home kind of vibe. It's a crafty kind of vibe and it's a different, a different light source. You're not going to do a bunch of really harsh lighting. You're not going to do a uh, single source area light. You want it to feel like this is in somebody's workshop or in somebody's house. So it has a point of view. And I, I, I think that's, that's, I just wanted to demonstrate what that can look like. Yeah. There's um, <clears throat> kind of a, a question around what we're talking about here from uh, Fernanda. So uh, could you comment on how to illuminate large scenes without dying at in the attempt. So what I'm getting from that question is when it comes to a, not, like, we're, we're talking a lot about one product or one thing in the, in the center of a scene. And maybe that's kind of what you were saying there, Chad, which was the natural light. When you, when it comes to lighting large scenes and a lot of stuff going on, I almost always just go to an HDR. That's, that's the solution. When there's a lot of things that need lit rather than throw up 50 different lights, try to, get it all perfect that's where an hdr really shines to me is is large scenes especially if the camera is moving a lot that's where this infinite dome 360 with maybe a couple practical lights scattered around can do a lot of that heavy lifting how do you approach larger scenes like that honestly i kind of like um it, it depends on what you're doing it depends on the time of day is it a large indoor scene is it a large outdoor scene um, I mean, obviously if it's a large outdoor scene, then your main light source is probably the sun and a bunch of little areas and lights that you might use to kick, uh, things off or rim things or fill. Um, and you're just kind of playing around with a uh, time of day if you, cause obviously, you know, we, we have the luxury of being able to control that. Um, so a lot of times if you're, if you're, it's a big outdoor scene, you're starting with daylight of some kind. If it's a night shot, and there isn't any daylight and it's a bunch of incandescent all around, then you're going to craft the light to, I, I tend to go like try to stay as natural as possible, like put the light sources where they would be naturally. Like if it's a outdoor scene of uh, a city, then obviously um, street lights and buildings and all that sort of thing would need to be set up. Uh, if you're talking about like uh, a large shot that's maybe at night, not in a city scene, then it's majority of it's going to be coming from moonlight and maybe, um, you know, incandescent lights that are in the scene, like campfires or flashlights or whatever, but just try to keep it as natural as possible. And I try not to, I try to only put light where they would be, um, in, in real life. Uh, I think that that's not always easy to do. Um, and it doesn't always work, but it's a good place to start. And if you're doing like architectural, um, visualization, then that's a really easy thing to kind of take a look at that and be like, okay, well, 
this room, this kitchen, living room, whatever, um, I'm going to start with the outside because most light in a house is coming from the outside. Mm -hmm. uh, and so just like, where's the sun look the best when it shines on the floor? Is it when it's in the, you know, in the dusk, when it hits the wall? And then from there, kind of craft it, reverse engineer it from there. But I mean, it's just such a, it, there really isn't like a blanket answer I can give. It's just about dissecting the situation. Chad, you got that low res thing going on again. I'm going to try my trick. Let me know in the comments if this helps. If Chad's super low res, I'm going to click on the wide. I'm looking hit, at the uh, YouTube and it looks fine. And then and then I zoom in. Did that change for anybody? Or is it just on my stream? It, it'd be nice to know that. Uh, thank you, Chad, for that. Um, I, I, the, the, you were mentioning, you know, thinking about how things are in real life. And I think for a lot of things, that's true. I think for the most part that that is a good way always to think about the scale of lights versus, you know, cause you're, you're divorced from real life when you're in 3d, you can make things as big or as small as you want in just like a mouse move. But one of the things I've always loved about most Pixar movies is they put a camera where a camera would go at a scale of the, the, uh, thing that they're trying to yes. shoot. Yes. Scale. So scale is all is like everything. So it's very rare at a Pixar movie. And this is like the opposite of a DreamWorks movie, for example, or early DreamWorks movies, I should say. I think I think there's a lot of different ways to approach this. But uh, a crane shot, you know, a crane only goes like 20, 30, 40 feet, maybe um, a dolly shot is about the size of a of a human. Right. You're about six feet, five, six, seven feet uh, of a shot. So think about not only where your cameras are, where your lights are, where your object is, and try to scale roughly those things in the same scale, and you will act, you will start to see a drastic difference in realism. And you won't even know what, what is happening, but your brain has, not only your brain, your 20, 30, 40, 50-year-old eyeballs have seen light in the real world for so long. Your lizard you, brain. Your lizard brain is now comparing uh, not only your dozens of years on the earth, but years and years of evolution of, of, of humans looking at things and understanding how things exist in the world. And anytime you, you fight that in 3D, you're going to have a problem. Now, you could do it stylistically. And in the DreamWorks example, you could fly through a bunch of you know bumblebees with a camera, and that is a thing to do in 3D but it will not feel real because we don't have the technology to fly through a bunch of bumblebees with a camera and actually see each one. And they're having conversations, let alone not even talking bumblebees. That's not the issue. Contrast that with toy story, which is also not realistic, a bunch of toys talking, but they keep a camera, the scale of where cameras go. They bring it down to the floor but they're not flying through the toy box, right? They, they, these are static camera shots. These are dollies. These are pans. These are maybe an establishing shot from the corner of the room, but that's it. Like they, they use scale with their, and I know we're going off into cameras, which is also <laughs> important. It's a whole other uh, show. We'll so save that'll, that. That'll be another show, but it, it is a reminder that scale matters. Oh my God. It matters so much. I don't think people realize how much it matters. Uh, Alex, but it, it does. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt there, Chad. So thank you, Alex, um, uh, for letting me know. That was just on my end. That's amazing. Hey, Paul. Good to see you, Paul. Paul Bad's here. Hey, Paul. Good to see you, man. Hope you're doing well. Loved your uh, music video, by the way. I still think about you, bud. Um, that was awesome. All right. Uh, let's get some more questions. And then uh, I think what we'll do at the end of this stream, so we're going on 45 minutes, let's do a couple more questions, Chad. And if you're down for it, maybe we can go into your uh, Cinema 4D and try to recreate something that uh, is on our mind or something we've talked about and talk about a little bit about scale, a little bit about HDRI and uh, kind of show, show off um, what we're talking about. Yeah, I could. I was thinking I might show a trick um, that I learned on set for lighting, uh, and use some HDRIs, some area lights, maybe some uh, area light maps. Awesome. Um, yeah, Richard's making a good point about textures. Um, scale is everything. When it when when you add a texture to a scene and it's like that doesn't look right, it's 
really often it's a sense of scale that's off. So if you put a brick on, obviously that's an obvious one. We all roughly know the size of a brick, right? We've all been around brick buildings. We know that they're about this big. So when you want to put that texture next to something and you want it to feel right, obviously that has to scale. That also matters with cameras. It matters with lights. It matters with all that. Uh, let's see a question here. This question, I think I, I think I understand it. Steve is asking, loves to see large scale sci-fi renders, especially the work of Paul. I don't know that name. Do you know that name? Shit, decent. They always seem very bright. Do you think these use one very large, very intense light? We may need an example, Steve, for that one. I don't know if I know that one. Let me Google. I'll, I'll, while you take the next question, I'll Google that person. All right. John, John brings up a good point. De depth of field is also something that is all about scale and so you know the not only does not only should scale matter right so think about how the real world exists and where the camera would be in the real world where how big the textures would be how where the lights would be positioned but i wanted to add one more wrinkle to this which is when when you think about how the real world would do lighting i think that gets you about 80, 90% of the way there, especially if what you're trying to sh shoot looks like just like a natural feeling uh, render like Chad had, where it's like on a tabletop. So you get those renders. It's really easy to, to pick a beautiful HDR, beautiful materials, scale them properly, aim a camera at it, and it looks nice. Where it gets tricky is when you're trying to be cinematic. When you're trying to be cinematic and more dynamic and more contrasty and more... Uh, epic, then you 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 should not think like the real world. You should think like a DP. You should think like you're on set. And that's where reading books about lighting. That's where studying, uh, you know, Pixar lighting or your favorite movie, how they light things, or even Chad said the tricks of the gaffers, the tricks of how to make a campfire look light look real on a TV show without smoke blowing all over the place. So they don't have real campfires when they're shooting a fire. They have tricks that probably make it a little bit brighter than a real campfire. Think about a cheesy example on a sitcom when they turn the lights off and go to bed. This bright blue light shines in from the outside that kind of fakes a moon. But it's way brighter than the moon will ever be. And that's because they need the light to, to, to make it look, uh, you know, to expose the film, right? But these are the lang this is the language of film that we've seen for hundreds of years, well, for over 100 years now. The language of film has evolved into a, a another way to tell stories that is different from the real world. So uh, it, again, it depends on what, uh, what you're trying to say. If you're trying to uh, say, wow, that looks really real. You want to respect the the how the real world exists. If you want right. that render to be, holy crap, that looks so amazing or epic or or like dramatic or I want to buy that, you may want to lean in a little bit heavier into the tricks of the trade. That's not just setting up real lighting. It's it's faking and tweaking and setting up the softbox just right. So the angle goes just across the edge of the iPhone it gives that nice little wrinkle. That's the stuff you need to study to create better and better looking lighting. Um, all right, Chad, what do you think? Do you, do you have a, we have a scene file here. We can. Um, yeah. I wanted to dissect that. Uh, Paul uh, Chad, 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 Chadison. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, but Let's jump in. I'll... Um, yeah, I found if you, uh, I'm Ready sharing to share my screen. screen? Yeah, right, I'm sharing. So uh, getting back to that question about like, you know, lighting these epic large types of scenes. And um, it's it's not as hard as you think. And it's really just some simple techniques that, that can get you pretty close to this. And obviously this is the sun. Like this is an outdoor scene. The sun is the main source. And you've got bounce coming up off of the earth into these buildings and stuff like that. But here's the trick. Like, I, and I think, um, you know, all the people that are really good at this type of, of concept art and, and, and stuff really kind of understand this. And that is the angle of the sun really, really matters. 
So if you notice in this shot here, um, we've largely got the sun behind our subject. It's it's kind of coming down maybe at like uh, two or three o'clock in the afternoon behind this building. And the reason being is because when you have the sun over your shoulder and it's shooting down at this building, let's say that that was the case and we could imagine we move our sun behind our shoulder. You've all of a sudden flattened out the entire shot. The entire shot now becomes flat because the light is going to be hitting this face directly and it's just going to be really, really boring. So what makes these kind of shots interesting is how the sun is raking across the surfaces and giving us just as much shadow as there is light. So it's just about choosing the right time of day for your sun and the position. This is a great example where we've just got like a shaft of light kind of shooting into this uh, this cavernous area here. So don't be afraid to let the sun um, not be front and center directly on your objects, but give the viewer some mystery, some shadow, some be able to tell what the shape is. And it gets back to what Nick was saying about you know our lizard brains being able to tell scale. And uh, we also we also use our lizard brains to make out dimensions and size and volumes of objects. And the way that we do that is how light falls off of things. So uh, if you really want to show the detail and the the immenseness of this of this castle or whatever this is, then you don't want to bathe the whole thing in light because now I can't tell what's what. I don't have a sense of volume. So letting things fall off to shadow is a really great way of telling the viewer, okay, this is big, or this goes around a corner, or this, you know, has a cavern inside of it, or whatever it is. But choosing that 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 angle is really important for this kind of thing. Yeah, something else I'm seeing with the, these images is the sense of scale not only comes from the angle of the sun, um, but the way that environment is used here. And we haven't talked a ton about it, but Actually, if you go back to that, any one of those last shots, Chad, I can't see it as much in this image, but you could see that there's an environment here and a depth of um, like fogginess that allows us to see the detail and almost feel the detail that isn't, in other words, it's not just black shadows. You're seeing a, a, a little bit of the haze of the of the daylight. And how blue things are like if you if you're are you oh yeah you're circling that's a perfect example so if we if we if you were to put the color picker up there chad we would see that that's not black right that's like a a, a greenish or a blue or something like that that is way brighter than you might think so so you you want it to feel in shadow yeah look at how look at how like relatively bright that is that's not anywhere near black and there's so, blue and and there's blue and why is there blue because there's sun right? So the sun and the sky and the haze and all of these things that happen and actually click on that second one, uh, or it's actually just to the left of this one, Chad, up in the um, block. Um, thank you for all your circles. People are asking how you do the circles. I'll have you answer that in a second. Oh, yeah. Check this out. So this one not only has the side raking sun that Chad mentioned, but it also has this nice haze. And what's the haze doing? It's doing First of all, giving a lot of blue texture and and to these to these details. I'm moving my my mouse over the screen like they can see it. Um, <laughs> I'll just pretend. Uh, I'll just like follow yeah, along. Can you move your mouse like you're me? Sure. Yeah, right there. Is, you're getting these blue. You you know we all think that that's just like shadow doing nothing. No, there's a lot of texture and realism that comes in adding that perfect environment. And on top of that, right behind the main structure, you're seeing a ton of blue blow out. And that's all haze and environment. And that's how learning how uh, the sun. Um, wow, I have so many questions about this tool, Chad. That's really cool. Is that averaging the the color? Yeah, yeah it's just blurring it, averaging That's the amazing. Color. So, okay, now I'm interested. What um, What's your little tool palette up there people were asking about? I can't tell you. It's private. <laughs> okay. it's private. Sorry. It's a, no, it's, it's, a, it's called ShareX. It's like my favorite uh, screenshotting uh, application. I actually think that's uh, a little plug for one of our other YouTube videos, which is Chad's top ten Windows widgets or something like that. I think. Yeah. You, I think you actually think I, show this one. I do. Yep. So uh, on the on the YouTube's, uh, check out Chad's if you're a Windows user. Uh, it's like top five, top ten Windows. Type in Chad Ashley in Windows. Grace Gogrill, if you need to, it should pop up. He, he'll show you more of what this tool does. It's really cool. Okay. 
um, we should we should do some real some real cinema 4ds here folks uh how do we take this all into play so sean's got a let's start with hgris and then if we have time we'll we'll set up something more like a like an area light maps kind of thing or some soft boxes but sean asks a good question which uh we all might be thinking which which is what is your thought process for selecting the right hdri for a scene so we have uh we have our scene here and we have a bunch of HDRIs, um, and you know what's 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 the process like? Walk me through how you look at this scene in particular, or if you have another scene we could do. How do you talk? How do you talk yourself through clicking through different HDRIs and and showing? You know, maybe maybe just kind of do it live a little bit. Like show us what you're clicking on and what what your what emotions you're having and how you're narrowing it down to telling the story that you want to tell. Yeah, um, I, I really kind of just kind of think through it and really kind of decide what it is I'm doing and what this is for and what the goal is, you know? So if, if let's just say that we're creating a, um, a bike pedal commercial or something where we're gonna try to sell these Shimano bike pedals and so, you know, you could go with an outdoor scene, something like this, and I'll just start from scratch. I'll just kill this dome light right now and just add another one. And um, I'll throw HDR link tag on there and we'll throw our dome map into the HDR link tag. And then I'll open up the plus library and I'll change this to resolution preview so it goes a little faster. So I really just kind of decide like if I'm, if I'm gonna do like an outdoor scene, uh, I'll just click around until I'm looking for something that sort of has the right amount of highlights. This one's actually pretty good right off the bat. Um, but, you know, typically if you're doing a product shot like this, you're probably going to do something that is a little bit more studio lit and not going to be like, you're not going to find uh, the ultimate HDRI that's going to that's gonna work for you. Maybe an outdoor one might get you close, but you want to just maybe take it into more of like a studio approach. In which case, I'd probably I'd probably use for something like this Pro Studios Metal, uh, which are kind of built to make um, scenes like this look good. Metal, plastics, things like that. And one of my go-tos is this guy here. And I'm just going to take this light and we're going to rotate it a little bit. And really what I'm doing is I'm just watching what it's doing to this metal piece right here. And just trying to get a gradient here because the trick to doing um, shiny stuff is not necessarily the light, it's the reflections. And uh, especially when it comes to metal, there's very little diffuse element happening in metal. So you're not actually lighting it, you're modeling it through reflections. And what I, what I mean by that is you're telling the viewer what the shape is based on what it's reflecting. So with this kind of HDRI that's kind of got this, uh, let me just make this a little bit bigger here so you can see it a little bit better. This is part of the Pro Studios uh, metal. It looks really bizarre and weird. It's like these like gradients and noisy blobs of light. But when you throw that into an environment, it just kind of has this uh, really sexy softbox uh, look to it. And on set, the way that you would achieve this look is you would throw up a bunch of screens and you would put lights behind them or you'd walk lights in close to them and you'd create a gradient with light on set. So the beauty of 3D is that we can just make these happen and we don't have to like move lights around and do all that stuff. Although I will show you that technique in a second. Um, so this is something that I would probably do here. Although I might not use um, this HDRI as the background, I might, you know, drop in uh, like a plane or something and put that in there. And then I'd move this plane back a little bit. And I'd probably even move it back even a little bit further and make it quite a bit bigger somewhere in there. And then sometimes what I'll do is actually let me see how that's resolving. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll actually tell it not to even don't, I don't want this plane to actually even be affected by that dome light. So I'm coming in here and I'm telling the dome light to exclude that plane. And the reason being is because I'm going to take a different light. In fact, I'm going to take a spotlight. I know people like, like to shit on spotlights, but they're super useful. I think at least. 
And let's move it up here. And I'm just going to rotate it down a little bit. Actually, you know what I'll do? I'm going to use the nifty little feature here. Let's see if I can remember where it is. Um, let's see. Add target and tag and null. Boom. Okay, cool. So now I've just created a target. Let's go ahead and move that target down here, somewhere in there. I'm going to make this light pretty dang bright. understand why we're not seeing it right now. Let's see here. There we go. Getting that light in there. Now I'm just going to kind of find my angle that I want. I'm going to move this light pretty far out. And all I'm doing is just wanting to create a gradient, a nice, nice like fall off thing. little gradient. I'm just going to bring that out here a little bit. And the reason I like to use a spotlight for something like this is because I want to control that fall off. I want to control that angle. So I can come in here and mess with the fall off angle. I can also mess with the fall off curve. I'd probably want to bring the brightness up a little bit. Maybe not that far. Let's grab our area light target and just kind of move it where we want it. Let's move it down here, maybe. And we'll tighten up our area light a little bit, or our spotlight, rather. There's a real quick question here from Franco. It's like, where, it says, uh, where did you guys where did you guys apply the HDRI? As a dome light, as an environment, on the render engine, as a sky? Oh, yeah, sorry. I'll, I'll, and, I'll, I'll do that again. No, that's OK. I, I think what we'll refer you to is we just uploaded a bunch of videos that uh, show this exact process. So. Uh, that for Redshift, Octane, and Arnold, and also Physical Render, we just uploaded um, four videos called Getting Started With, uh, and then it's like uh, HDRI Link, which is what Chad's using to light this scene, and uh, HDRI Studio Rig. If you use Physical Render, HDRI Studio Rig does some of this as well. So what I'd recommend, Franco, depending on what render you use, Physical, Arnold, Octane, or um, Redshift, Go find those videos. We just op uploaded them. And he actually uses this exact scene as well. So um, that way you don't have to restart there. And we could send Franco and anyone else looking to do this, but for your renderer and how to set it up, just check those videos out. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Chad. What no, I, wanted, good. I, I didn't I didn't mean to interrupt there. I just saw that a nice uh, question there. Um, what I what you reminded me of was was gradient, right? You said the magic word. And you said it a little bit about lighting things that are reflective. It's always about the contrast and it's always about sweeping the light across. And if you ever see a render and you're like, that looks too flat or too boring, it's usually that the light is hitting everything at the same angle and giving it all the same shape. And as soon as you could have contrast and gradient and say, this is the obvious dark side of the object and this is the obvious light side, more you could do that, that and play with it, the more uh, contrast you're going to create and the more differences between black and white and different colors are you're going to create. And honestly, the more your eye is just attracted to it. It's, it's how eyes work. We only see contrast. Uh, uh, the differences in shapes and how things are there only exist if there's, if there's contrast in lighting. So the more that you can add contrast, the more interesting it looks and the more uh complex it looks at, like for example in this scene um in fact even as uh even as a anti-example chad now that you have this beautiful render can i ask you to like mess it up and and do a really flat front lit look with this same <laughs> angle sure uh just I'll so we can all see you know yeah. like this is a really nice backlit or even what you had there with a great with the with like a this literal silhouette has like a vibe to it yeah but now yeah. now show an overly front lit scene which which a lot of us fall into and what that could feel like so that we know when when it when it's there and how to avoid it too yeah so what do you got you got air light going on yeah bringing it up in the front i'm just gonna like kind of point it from the camera pov yeah. and even this is not that bad like it you, i could work with something like this but if you take away well, you, uh, our backdrop and now it's looking pretty bad like now it looks very like default lit kind of a thing exactly default but, light 
but you could make some even like just like putting on a background and letting that fall off naturally is great but now the problem with this area light is that it's just a flat it's just a flat color it's just not there's nothing there's no detail to it right now so if, if I bring the scale of this light, you notice how the intensity goes up because bigger light, more light, you know? So we'll bring that intensity down a little bit. And now if we wanted to make this, even this kind of garish lighting look a little bit better, I would throw area light maps onto it. So I'd throw an HDRI link tag onto that light and then grab that light's texture, dump it into the HDRI link tag, and now jump over to area light maps and Let's pick a uh, texture for our light. I'm going to use a softbox. And let's also make sure that that is going to be using preview resolution. OK, so now uh, it's kind of difficult to see. But if I scale this light up a little bit more, I think it'll be easier. So now we don't have a single value representing this entire light. It's not a white box anymore. This box actually has uh, this texture on it. Let me get down there. It has wrinkles. This is actually a real photograph of a light of a of a softbox, an HDRI, that now is mapped on this area light using our plugin HDRI link. And what that does is it's going to emulate that that studio softbox. You're going to pick up those reflections in those reflections, some of those wrinkles and that gradient that happens at the center. And another one of my favorite ones to do like stuff like this is use these abstract uh, light maps here. Like this one here is great because you can just you can, it just kind of creates this like blobby gradient that just looks great on metal. So if I take that guy and I scale it up and maybe move it, rotate it a little bit. Another thing that I like to do, I don't know if everybody knows this trick, but this little fly down here will add a target and a null to my area light in Redshift. So that way I can just select my target and move my target to where I want to point my light. In our case, it's going to be right there. And now I'll grab my light. And I'll maybe move it up a little bit just to, I'm going to do like a top light. I think that would look pretty cool. I'll kind of push, push it off that surface a little bit. Now I'm just working on this rim right here. And that's really what a lot of this kind of shots are is like, you're just crafting, crafting the shape through reflections and trying to get the look that you're after. So this light might be good, but I might want to make it a little bit longer so that that reflection goes a little bit further over that pedal. And that's looking pretty good. But now notice how the chrome, so the chrome doesn't look chrome anymore. You see, it looks like black. You can't tell the chrome from the black uh, painted metal, right? And that's a problem because obviously there's no such thing as like a completely black void studio. If I shot this in a studio and I had a, I went and I rented a studio and I put a big soft box above it and I threw a piece of like fabric behind these petals in the warehouse, there's still light. There's still the 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 guy standing in the back at drinking a coffee. There's still a door open somewhere. There's something back there that's going to reflect in that metal. So that's when I'll use like a, a dome light or an HDRI just to give us some of that detail back. And I'll bring the exposure on that light down by like maybe five stops. And maybe that's too far. Maybe like not so many stops. But notice now we've got detail in our metal, which we didn't have a second ago. I'm just going to go ahead and send this to the picture viewer so we can really see what that means. So let's turn that light, not the area light, turn off that dome light, which is going to be kind of our fill reflection. So we'll let that converge for a second. Yeah, you're you're reminding me too um, of something that I do a lot. I know you do too, which is when, an, when is an HDRI not enough? And HRI, HRI is like you said, with that really natural render you were talking about before that photo, they could do a lot. Um, but whenever, whenever an HRI is not enough, it's often that you just need like one more light. And so in this example, you have some nice general gradient reflections around, but then you specifically, and you as an artist should think like this too, you specifically wanted a big, nice uh, gradient across the top of that pedal. So you brought a real light out. When I say real light, I mean an area light that is super controllable exactly where it is in 3D to get your creative moment there that you wanted or the client wanted. But then you relied on an HDR to kind of fill in the details. Or if it's an outdoor scene to maybe give it that like there's trees around and there's a sky around kind of feel. 
but then you are still in control by art directing one or two lights. And I, I know it's something you, you taught me a lot how to do, and, and it's something I'm reminded just watching you uh, do this as well. Yeah, I think just by, you know, using HDRIs to fill stuff in uh, or set the mood and then using area lights to really direct the viewer's eye, because obviously an HDRI is not going to, it'll be hard to get the exact placement of highlight that you want using an HDRI. You could get pretty damn close and sometimes it's enough, but sometimes you just need that extra bit of control, which is kind of nice to be able to have that. So in our case here, um, you know, this HDRI is just providing a really nice little fill. But, you know, if I was going to take this further, I'd probably add another area light to like give us a separation of the of this pedal because this black part of the pedal is very flat right now. I can't really tell what the shape is. So I need a reflection coming off the front of that. I would probably want to work that in there and make that happen. But before we um, run out of time, can I show you another technique? Uh, yes, please. Uh, there's two questions real quick. I think okay, we can yeah, answer. let's do that. And then, uh, and then we'll kind of wrap up with one more technique. How's that sound? Perfect. All right. Uh, first one is um, uh, this one from Metal Gear MK3. Can I buy all the softbox textures? And then that really cool emoji with the with the chin thing. Yes. Um, the, everything, including the uh, HDRI link plugin that you saw us use to connect the HDRI. All these HDRIs, all of these softbox textures, everything here in the library, and a ton of plugins we haven't even used uh, today, uh, and of course training as well, is all included in Grayscale Gorilla Plus. So if, if you're new here or you're not familiar with Grayscale Gorilla, we create tools, training, plugins, materials, assets, HDRIs, all of this stuff here to help you guys uh, render faster, uh, create more beautiful lighting and really give some of the knowledge that we've learned over the years and put it directly into these uh, assets, including materials and HDRIs and these soft boxes, so that you can light with the with the tools that we've always wanted as artists. Uh, we created them and then we created Grayscale Gorilla Plus to give it all to you guys uh, really, really affordably. So check that out if you're new to Grayscale Gorilla. Uh, we have tons of videos as well. Uh, if you subscribe or check out YouTube, we have other uh, things that are included in Grayscale Gorilla Plus, training, all that stuff. Go check it out. But that is the best way to get access to all of this stuff, including all of our plugins and training as well. So definitely check that out. Thank you, Metal Gear MK3, for the question. One more quick one as well. And this is something I don't know the answer to. Chat, maybe you could help out. Can you blur an HDRI in Redshift? Have you... Not in a way that's going to be very useful. Um, you could, uh, I'm not sure in Redshift, but I know in Arnold, you can just change the the MIP map value, which is basically kind of like blurring, but not really. So the answer to the question is no, but um, there are some hacks that you can do. Uh, I recommend just taking it into your image editor of choice and scale, scale it down and blur it. Do what you need to do. Awesome. Um, okay. Thank you guys. Uh, we'll um, try to save a few minutes for some rapid fire questions at the end. But Chad, you had another thing to show, um, and I could watch you light a scene all day. So please take it, <laughs> take it from here. All right. Show me, uh, show me what you got. Okay. So I get this question asked a lot, which is, how do I create uh, something that looks like uh, this kind of a thing? where you have something on a void surface that's shiny and you see it a lot in like beverage commercials and beverage shots and things like that. This kind of look here um, is what I'm going to quickly demonstrate how to get that look. Uh, it's actually just, you're actually going to be copying a lot of what you see on a real set. So I have the same petals here and I'm just going to drop down a really simple plane and we're going to give that a little bit of space between the ground and our petals here. I am going to rotate this object just slightly up so that we get a little bit better of a shot and then I'll just bring it up. Okay. So what I'll do is just kind of rough out the scene and then I'm going to get into the more of the details, but uh, let's grab another plane and this plane, we're going to make sure it's facing Z and we'll throw it back here somewhere like that. All right. That's looking pretty good. 
And you're going to be shocked at how easy something like this is to set up because I'm just going to grab a uh, spotlight. Uh, let's just grab a spotlight and it even puts it in the right spot for me. That's just kind of magical. Uh, let's go ahead and bring the cone angle on that way up and the fall off all the way down. All right, so we'll do that and we're going to angle it up just a little bit like this and maybe bring it down a little bit like that. All right, that looks pretty good. Now we're going to set up our camera. Uh, first thing I want to do is make sure I can see what the hell I'm doing. So let's jump into a camera. I'm just going to plop one in here real quick. And we are going to change our aspect ratio to something tall. Because that looks much cooler. So we'll just do like a 720. Oops, not that. 720. If we type not that tall. That'll do it. All right, so let's jump in here. Lenses matter. I don't know. We should. We'll save that talk for our next uh, our next call. But I am not yeah, going to let us get... know in the comments if you want us to do a video about cameras and lenses. Because every every time I go off on a tangent about lenses, I feel like everybody leaves. But it is so important. <laughs> it is so important. So you let us know uh, in the comments, and if enough people say it, and if you're watching this later, uh, please add it as well, and we'll uh, hopefully do one. But uh, okay. All right, so, go ahead. <laughs> so, okay, we've got our we've. This is going to come together so fast that it's you might miss it. So let me change this. I don't know why the hell this intensity multiplier. If Maxon, if anybody's there from Maxon watching, why does why does the spotlight come in with like an insane amount of intensity? Uh, okay, so that's looking pretty good. Let's bring our cone angle down. Now comes the super simple part. I'm going to drop down a redshift material, and we're going to just make this material. A mirror. So I'm going to drop down a regular old redshift material and we'll come over here. We'll choose a preset of, uh, I won't even change the preset. I'm just going to grab a metalness for an L type and bring that all the way up and make sure that my, my color is all the way white. And there you go. You got yourself one of those nifty beverage shots, right? You've got the, the foundation of it is there. Now all we have to do is add some lighting to our, our petals. And the easiest way for the sake of this demo, I would probably come in with a bunch of area lights and area light maps and like really craft it. But for the sake of speed, I'll just drop down an, a dome light and H dry link and we'll just do that same thing. Grab our dome light, I'll just go in here. And I didn't even have to do anything. Like it just kind of looks good right there. That was the default one that just popped up that just kind of works. But I'm gonna go ahead and uh, choose one of the uh, Pro Studios metal ones just because I think it might actually be a little bit better for me. I'm just watch again, I'm just watching the front face and then I'm going to rotate it in a second. But the other thing I don't want is I don't want that that background plane that we created to be affected by that dome light. So I'm going to go down and to project or project, however you want to say it, and I'm going to exclude that and I'm also going to exclude our mirror. And there you go. I mean, I would finesse the hell out of this and add some depth of field, maybe some scratches, little imperfections, little area light stuff going on. But that in a nutshell is how easy it is to set up one of those types of shots. And here, I'll just jump out into the uh, perspective view so you can really see. Actually, we'll lock that to our other camera. So again, it's just a mirror floor. So if I was shooting this, this would be like black plexi. And this would be like uh, a piece of fabric that we hang up with um, that's like maybe on a uh, maybe, you know, on a stand or something. And uh, if I was on set, I would probably have the light behind this sh shining through it. But, you know, we're in 3D. We can put the lights wherever the hell we want. So this light is just sitting right there. Let's just go into this kind of shot. So that's that's really all there is to it just dissecting things like this and you can really start to understand how to create them in the real or not in the real world but in in 3d that's amazing and can you show um maybe a couple more hdris um that are how does it does this setup work as well when it's like outdoor looks or any other it, types it's, of looks, it's, or is it it's, more it's, studio it's more studio but if we did like a uh like a office setting it can kind of work but it's more it, this is more for like a studio type of shot if i was going to do like a shot of them like laying on the ground or something let's let's just do that really quick we'll just rotate these guys let's come in here and we'll set up like a more natural 
kind of shot here. So if I was like this, and maybe these guys are rotated on the ground somehow. Something like that. Obviously, this we're not going to be able to use this plane anymore. So I'd probably use like a... This guy's going to go away. And I don't think I put that on the right one. And we'll... Oh, I remember what's happening now. Let's grab these guys and remove all. There we go. All right. So if we were doing like a, uh, you know, an intimate kind of shot and we can just kind of push these guys down into the ground a little bit. Actually, the ground's a lot farther than I thought. <laughs> all right. So there we go. Let's just, go. I'm doing this. So I'm doing this so cheaply right now. I'm embarrassed that I'm doing this so cheaply. Uh, but we're just going to set up the shot anyway, just because it's fun. All right, so we don't want a shiny, we don't want anything shiny happening right there. So I'm going to grab that material and just destroy its reflection. Gone, we'll just do like a matte color. We'd probably be like put some wood down there or something like that. But all right, so now we've got like a more of an intimate shot. And again, cameras matter. So I'm going to jump into my camera and grab a redshift tag and redshift camera tag and turn on bokeh override enabled i want the focus distance to be yep from the camera which is going to be great because i'm going to grab that camera go into physical and if i was shooting this in real life i don't think it's, these scales are actually or the um these pedals aren't to scale but so this is where the photographic knowledge comes in so if you were shooting this on a point and shoot or even a dslr on your desk right now you had these pedals sitting on your desk with a light from the room in your shot you're probably going to have your f-stop anywhere between depending on the time of day and how much light is in your room anywhere from like a f4 to like if it's really bright it might be f11 f13 somewhere in there and that's going to affect the depth of field so i'm just going to say that it's a pretty medium lit kind of shot in my office here. And so I'm gonna set it to right there. And then I'm gonna grab my camera and say, pick focus and I'll pick that focus to be right there. And you can see this is this shot is not to scale. Otherwise we'd have a little bit more depth of field happening right here. So I'll cheat that a little bit. And this is where scale matters. I try to work in actual units in world units. So this I don't think is, but just for the sake of this video, I'm gonna go ahead and cheat it. I'll take my camera and say it's not, a, it is actually not an F5, it's gonna be an F1, just to get a little bit more, that's probably too far, maybe like 1.6, somewhere in there. All right, now let's play around with what dome light we wanna use, right? What, what mood do you want, Nick? What are you thinking? Oh, goodness. I mean, I'm thinking we got some pedals here. Maybe it's, maybe we're outdoors for this one. You know, outdoors. Okay. Okay. Well, we got I mean, I usually like indoor lighting more, but I want, it tends to be a little bit more interesting for sure. Uh, we've got a ton of sky, uh, sky, um, H drives that are great. But the thing about sky HDRIs and when there's nothing else in the HDRI is that our metal can kind of look flat, right? Our metal doesn't look very interesting because metal is only going to, you know, it's reflecting. And if the only thing that it has to reflect is clouds, then that's probably not a good choice for us. So oh, let's see what else. Franco, we got. Franco's got the answer. Warehouse. Oh yeah. Warehouse. Yeah. All right. Modern industrial. We've got some warehouses. So let's take a look. This is one of my favorites. This one also is pretty great. And I think I'm going to veto the warehouse idea. Oh, wait, no, nope. I just landed on the one I like right here. <laughs> All right. So I'm just going to tweak this just a little bit, though, because I don't like that highlight being so bright. Ooh, okay. That's got a good gradient to it. It's not bad. Um, again, it's blown out right here. We'd probably want to fix that, but um, it's not bad. It gets us some of the way there. And then we might add a few area lights to kick this, this shape off a little bit more because right now it's kind of just like sitting in the, in the dark. Um, but yeah, this isn't bad. So you want to find light sources that, that make it interesting. And you're, you can usually tell what's interesting just by looking at it. But uh, if you're looking for a rule of thumb, it's usually things backlit things look beautiful things that have the light raking across them in an interesting way look beautiful. Rarely does something very even and, and, and straight on look beautiful. So this warehouse is a good option, but I honestly, I would honestly kind of go with one of these more like office ones. And then I'm going to rotate, rotate this guy. 
so we get that sun in there in the right spot something like that's not too bad and then i think what i would probably do is you know maybe add another area light or maybe even uh another hdri but i think i'm going to look for the perfect one and actually you know um one of my favorite sets of ours is uh one that you shot nick road trip so Road Trip is just a ton of mixed environments that are filled with like uh, windows and incandescent lights. And uh, a lot of times I'll click around in here until I find like a base of what I want. There's one in here that I'm looking for in particular. I think it might be this guy. Or maybe it was, I forget which one it is. It might be this one. Even this is kind of interesting in a weird way. But um, yeah, I think I would probably go with something like this and then I would rotate it until I found the angle that I want like that and might bring up the intensity a little bit. Exposure comes up. Ooh. I'm also going to change my, uh, my ground material to be something a little bit whiter. Now we're getting somewhere. Okay. So yeah, it's just experimentation, you know, experimentation. Sometimes I, I use H dry link just to kind of experiment to find a mood that I might not be even be sure I want. And then once I find it, I build off of that. That's awesome. Um, well, I, I already have like ideas for three more shows right now, just <laughs> by watching this. Some, even just some like floor, how you set up nice looking floor wood type things like that. We had somebody mention aces in the, uh, 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 comments as well. We're going to talk about the post process slash LUTs slash all of that stuff. I think that's a good uh, idea for a show down the road. Uh, we got cameras on the books. Thank you guys for saying uh, yes to the camera show as well. So this is good. Um, thank you, Chad, for doing this. Guys, in the comments, uh, if you like this format, um, I'm going to get back to our faces here, Chad. Thank you for sharing all that. Uh, I just oh, threw wait. a text. I just threw a text around. Hey, you got some, here, I'll let you, I'll let you play around with some materials. Um, and I just wanted to thank you guys for, uh, the questions and for, um, uh, uh, you know, sh sharing some of your thoughts on, on lighting. And we want to hear too, what you guys want to learn. Um, uh, we're going to do more of these live shows and, uh, just talk about our process uh, how we go about making renders, um, and also show you some of the tools we've created, uh, to help speed all this up. So everything, uh, including all the HDRIs, the materials that Chad's setting up for the floor, uh, all the plugins, uh, including HDRI, uh, link, um, and all of our stuff now is, is all included in Grayscale Gorilla Plus. So we uh, actually just added all of the HDRIs and HDRI link, HDRI studio rig, uh, and a couple other plugins as well to uh, plus um, this week. So if you're a member, you have access to all of this stuff right now. You can start using it, including all those softbox profiles and everything. And if you're not a member, go check it out. We created it just for you guys that do this work for a living. Um, so if you want to uh, get instant access to everything here, go check it out at grayscalegorilla.com. Uh, and let us know about future shows of what else you guys want to learn. Um, these are the fundamentals, uh, lighting, camera, materials, um, composition, which is another topic we didn't quite talk about, but composition, scale, uh, environment, um, emotion, product shots, all these things, um, are things that many of us just do, uh, all, you know, for, for clients, for a living. And, um, we love hearing the questions you guys have because we want to help and we want to um, bring some of that knowledge that we've you know struggled with over the years and learn learn how to make better and, and try to bring it to you guys. So the questions from you guys help so much. I appreciate it. Um, we're going to have a few extra minutes here once we go back to our faces of like a quick lightning round. If you guys have some um, quick questions here at the end, anything else about lighting, uh, or even show topics uh, for future live shows. I would love to hear some of your topics, what you got. I appreciate it. All right. Let's see here. Um, Steve, I appreciate it. Thank you. Ditto. Thank you. Ryan, I appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Guy, thanks for the questions. Chad, what do you got? You got uh, 
you got your your I know it's not your final render. I know. Because nothing still, ever is a final yeah, render. Yeah, I know. The deadline <laughs> comes and that's when the final render is done, right, Chad? Exactly. All right, I'm gonna pop back to our faces here and uh boom. Awesome. Uh quick question uh as we wrap up, how was the resolution of that screen share? We uh wanted to make that better for you guys based based on feedback from the last show so if that was readable and follow alongable for you guys uh, i know it wasn't quite a tutorial but it was more how we use this stuff let us know if that was uh how that looked out there on the internet that would give us um some help and help us uh do more of these as well if it's looking good we got some ideas here it looks great kellen thank you dean said a uh, nailing scale when it comes to 3D, scale is everything. Cheers from Chi-Town. Cheers, Chicago. I saw my buddy Jack here, if he's still here. Hi, Jack. In fact, you are clicking out around the road trip uh, HDRIs, and uh, like five of those, in fact, the one that you ended up using was from a uh, trade show, a pinball tournament show that Jack and I and my buddies go to every year. It is a giant uh, Pittsburgh place with beautiful big windows out facing the river. And I shot a few of those HDRIs right there. <laughs> That's so, awesome. I've seen, I think Dave Kiss is in one of these too. I, I caught him in the background of uh, one of them. Dave's definitely in a few. I think Jack's in a few. Uh, also, um, Dave Kiss's kitchen is one of oh. those warehousey looking ones as well. Um, question let's see here quality looks good to me wendy thank you so much i appreciate that thanks for the feedback solid res resolution ryan says appreciate it jack <laughs> miss you buddy hope you're doing well um uh we're, we're talking jack into into back into doing 3d oh, we're gonna nice. get we're gonna get you back buddy um uh let's see here uh, do I still shoot H to rise with a theta? No, all of those road trip, uh, uh, that road trip collection that's included, uh, in, in the library and in plus and everything, all of those are created with the theta. And, but now all of our H to rise are created in many different ways, uh, and much higher quality, by the way, uh, the theta is pretty good, uh, when it comes to lighting, but it's hard to use as a backdrop because the resolution isn't quite there. Um, a lot of the new modern uh, HDRIs that are included in Plus are uh, higher res. There are also a lot of studio stuff that's created in 3D in other ways, or even our skies, which are higher res. Um, so it's all over the place. I now. still like the low res ones, though. I got to be love, honest. I love those road trip ones. I know because, you know, there's just something about like, I'm not using them for backdrops like ever. Right. So for me, it's just about interesting reflections and interesting light sources and the theta. I, I got to check out the new theta. It's been a while. I think I saw my old theta somewhere over here, but um, yeah, I, I, yeah, that was an older one for me. I mean, those those were shot five years ago, maybe, but they hold up. Like you just you finish that render with with those. So I love those road trip ones. It, um, maybe we should have gone through more of what each category is there, why we created oh, yeah. it, but we could do that in another show. Um, I would suggest you guys um, go check it out. It, they're actually all available on our website to see all the differences. We have studi different studio uh, HDRIs, uh, skies, um, the European collection, the European, uh, uh, what, what, what did we end up calling that one? I'm forgetting now. Uh, uh, the European holiday. European holiday uh, has a few of my favorites, including the church entrance, which is probably one of my faves. Um, they all have Modern their place. industrial is also super rad. Yeah, they all have their place. And until uh, recently, you had to buy them all separately uh, for each specific job you had. And and maybe you needed skies, so you had to come get the skies. Now, uh, if you're a Plus member, you just get them all. And so we wanted the ability for you guys to say, like, maybe it's a sky one and click it and go, nah, it's more of a industrial one, just like Chad went through. No, nah, it's more of a metals indoor studio one. No, nah, it's more of an office that's honestly how I um, find a lot of my favorite HDRIs is just experimentation, just like Chad went through there. Um, so go check it out. Uh, just add it all to plus Brazil's here. That's amazing. Um, Otto, thank you for this. Um, I think the the format worked out for this one. I, I like these deep deeper dives into one um, topic, the way that this one turned out today. So look for more of those. Uh, if you are watching on YouTube, do us a favor and hit the, the thummy thing. Uh, 
because the thumb thing tells YouTube that this is uh, a good video and shows it to other people. Um, and if you want, uh, what do they call it? Notifications. When we're going live, uh, we, we uh, try to pre-schedule these and we tell YouTube when we're going live. And in turn, YouTube will tell you when we're going live if you click the bell, the notifications. I feel like everyone says hit the bell, but they don't tell you what the bell does. The bell lets you know when we're going live. It lets you know when we have new videos out. And for any of you who are watching that demo and uh, saw Chad use Redshift, and, and I saw a few questions come by that said, how does this work in Octane? Um, or if you're using Arnold or even physical renders, we just released four separate videos on that workflow and how to use like kit, uh, or I'm sorry, how to use HDRI link and HDRI studio rig with all those HDRs and how to set it up for your renderer. Those are the latest videos out in, um, on Grayscale Gorilla. If you go to our main page. So, uh, thank you guys so much. Um, I appreciate it. Sean uh, has a quick question here. Do we need to have HDRI link installed to use the HDRIs? Uh, you don't. Um, but if you're a Plus member, you have access to all of it. So you could just in uh, install HDRI link or HDRI Studio Rig. But if you have any of our packs separately and you just want to use them separately, that works as well. Uh, but HDRI link we created to make it so that you could literally click on those squares at the bottom and it instantly loads into your scene. So we recommend using those together. Um, all right, anything else that we see? I think we should wrap up. That's a pretty good show. This was fun. That was good, man. I'm uh, good. We could do like several series in lighting, I feel like. Yeah, yeah, okay, there you go. The The lighting videos are, are, um, are not over. Sean says he's, um, He's a plus member. So Sean, thank you. You have access Thanks, to um, uh, not only all of those HDRIs, but HDRI link and HDRI studio rig if you use physical render as well. So definitely check that out. Um, if you're interested in plus, uh, go check it out. We just added a bunch of new stuff. And if you're a plus member, thank you guys. Uh, we created it just for you guys to work faster, light faster, add materials faster, uh, all the stuff, training, plugins, it's all there in, in um, plus and we appreciate you guys. Um, let's, uh, let's wrap this one up. And, uh, again, uh, thank you guys so much for the questions. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being uh plus members, Chad. Thank you for thank you. not only teaching me what the hell an HDRI was, uh, uh, what it, what, what would it be now? 14 years. Let's not date. Anything. Don't put a date on that. Let's not date anything. Thank you, Chad, for bringing the world, the amazing world of, of 3d lighting into my heart and into my soul and now into all of theirs. I uh, appreciate you and uh, stay tuned for another live show. Uh, hopefully next week, if not the week after. So hopefully we'll see you guys soon until then. Thank you guys so much. And we will see you in another Grayskull Gorilla video real soon. Bye, Bye everybody. everybody. Happy Wednesday.